the moment we realized we needed to do this project was when we found in the lab, if we shined light on triclosan, it made a dioxin, which is a toxic chemical. If that was happening out in the environment, we needed to know. So we approached the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund with the idea that we wanted to look in wastewater effluents and in lakes and rivers downstream to see if triclosan and other contaminants were accumulating in the environment. 25? 75. Oh, that's about right. It looks like we're heading right towards the waypoint. We use chemicals because they're useful in all kinds of ways. We use them in the clothing I'm wearing, the stuff that I wash my hands with, or to grow our crops. There's thousands that produce new ones all the time, and we almost always discover the problem after the fact. The triclosan is what we call an emerging contaminant, something that wasn't around historically. It's uh, antibacterial. This was an example of a triumph of marketing over science, where if you had triclosan in your product, people would think it was better. Its primary first use was in liquid hand soaps. It made its way into all sorts of other disinfectants and different consumer products, anti-gingivitis toothpaste, acne face washes. It was infused into plastics. All of those things, once they're used, they wash down the drain. They don't just go away. There's the old phrase that dilution is the solution to pollution and that is a falsehood. It winds up in the environment. And so we knew we had to do something bigger than go out into the field. We'll just do a gravity core here then. In order to understand the impacts, we need some sort of historical record. And one of the most powerful records we can get is from sediments that accumulate in the bottom of lakes. But we can go back a few hundred years and see when things began to change to understand how bad things are or how natural they are. And so we have a clear plastic tube. We're able to push that into the bottom of the lake. Then we pull that up to the surface. We have this tube of mud. We may section it in the field a centimeter at a time, put each of those sections into a little container and bring it back to the lab to analyze. We sampled seven lakes in Minnesota, from Lake Pepin in the south to Ely in the north. Once or twice a month, we were going to different lakes the most adventuresome one was we took the university's research vessel out onto Lake Superior and took sediment cores about seven miles away from Duluth Harbor. To determine the age of a sample, we use a dating technique called lead 210, which is a naturally occurring radioisotope that falls out of the atmosphere at a constant rate and then decays away. And we can measure the amount of that in a core sample. If you can't date the sediments, you can't do any of this. After we collect the samples in the field, it's about a month's worth of lab work. We take subsamples and freeze dry the sediments to do an extraction process where you put hot fluid through it to pull out the chemicals. Then there's sample cleanup to remove the other stuff that isn't what we're looking for. And then we use analytical instrumentation to specifically identify what chemicals are present and quantify how much is there. In every wastewater sample we looked in, we found triclosan. And in all of the lakes we looked in, we found triclosan, even seven miles away from Duluth Harbor and Lake Superior. Every place we looked, we found it, except for Little Wilson Lake, which is in the Superior National Forest and has very little human activity around it. And those toxic dioxins that we were curious as to whether they formed followed the exact same pattern as triclosan, making up a majority of the dioxins in the lake sediments. These dioxins were degradation products from the interaction of triclosan with sunlight, we started to realize that we have a real problem here because certain dioxins have been known to be very harmful. An advantage of funding from the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund for Minnesota citizens is that we have to report back to the legislature on what we found. In our case, there were non-governmental organizations that saw the results and started advocating for potential restrictions on triclosan. There were also legislators that saw this as a threat to our water quality. I was most surprised by how quickly action occurred. We're banning this in Minnesota. We don't care what you do in the rest of the country. The legislative process worked as it should. Minnesota is really unique in having this trust fund dedicating financial support to environmental issues, which means that we can get a jump on these kinds of problems. Minnesota's ban and the publicity 
led to a much closer look at triclosan by various environmental stakeholder groups as well as the FDA. And in about a year, triclosan and other compounds were pulled from lots of consumer products nationwide. Science aims to generate answers, but with every answer it generates, you get more questions. Some of them are more important than the primary question you were trying to answer. And so with additional trust fund money, we started exploring whether or not there were other antibacterial compounds and medications being released into the environment and whether that might present an issue with regards to antibiotic resistance. And that makes me proud because our research certainly helps Minnesotans. But the findings we have here have implications across not just the U.S., but even in some cases around the world.